Well, on behalf of the National Endowment for Democracy and our partners, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, welcome to this discussion on the role of independent media in strengthening democratic resilience in the Indo-Pacific, opportunities for U.S.-Taiwan cooperation. This public discussion serves as a side event for the U.S.-Taiwan consultations on democratic governance in the Indo-Pacific region. The governments of Taiwan and the United States began this forum in 2019 to serve as a mechanism for the United States and Taiwan to explore ways to increase cooperation and pursue joint initiatives that assist other countries and the region to address key governance challenges. I think this effort underscores our emphasis here at the endowment on the need for democracies and Democrats to work in common cause. Democratic solidarity is the key ingredient to pushing back on the forces fraying democracy today, from aggressive authoritarians to demagogic populists. And engaging civil society is central to effective democratic governance, showing that democracy can indeed deliver. So that's why we're gathered today, building on the past two consultations, which also engage civil society representatives to highlight the crucial role of non-governmental organizations and upholding democratic values and processes. So this year, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy and the National Endowment for Democracy have invited NGO representatives, academics, media professionals to discuss how protection of press freedom and a vibrant media environment contribute to countering authoritarian powers and restoring trust in democratic institutions. Taiwan, of course, boasts one of the most vibrant and free media ecosystems in Asia, and independent media is an important feature of Taiwan's commitments for the upcoming Summit for Democracy as well. And Taiwan is an example of the importance of independent media and efforts to port, support democracy in the region and around the world. So we want to explore today how the governments of Taiwan and the United States, as well as civil society in both countries, can work together to support independent media and press freedom in the Indo-Pacific region, especially in 2020, this, this, uh, during the Democracy Summit, so-called Year of Action. Um, all of our viewers know that Taiwan is now the epicenter of freedom in the world. It is among the freest nations in Asia and indeed the world, and it's increasingly a hub for Democrats in the region to connect and learn from each other, and unfortunately at times to seek refuge. Today's discussion is both part of this annual consultative process, but it's also a scene setter both for the Summit for Democracy taking place uh, next month as well as our own convening of the Global Assembly of the World Movement for Democracy, which will take place in Taipei next October. So today is about harnessing democratic unity, bolstering democratic resilience, and generating democratic momentum. To lead our discussion, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Nick Benequista, who is the Senior Director for the Center for International Media Assistance. Nick draws from his extensive experience in international media development, applied research, democracy support, and journalism. He's been a foreign correspondent in three countries, including as bureau chief for Bloomberg News in Mexico City. He's overseen policy-oriented research projects around the globe with the UK's Institute for Development Studies, Canada's International Development Research Center, and has been an advisor and consultant to multilateral organizations. Nick, it's great to have back, back in the endowment family. Over to you. Thanks so much, Damon. Thanks. Uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, as Damon said, I'm Nick Benequista, the Senior Director of the Center for International Media Assistance, uh, which is a research unit at the National Endowment for Democracy that focuses on media development. And, and media development, we understand, is a, a process by which the field or sector of news media changes for the better. Uh, that process of change is, of course, related to advertising markets and technology, regulations, professional development, business models, norms, a range of factors. Uh, unfortunately, and as many of you are aware, things uh, have been trending in the wrong direction globally for media development for about a decade now. And at SEMA, uh, we've been doing research and convening gatherings in that time in support of a more robust and effective response uh, from media actors, from the private sector, from civil society, digital rights activists, governments, and the international community. And so uh, I'm really delighted to be a part of any discussion that draws attention to the need for a far more significant effort to protect and sustain independent news media and to foster a vibrant and trustworthy digital public sphere. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific region especially, uh, much more can be done. And today uh, we have a panel co-hosted by uh, the NED and by the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy that looks at how the efforts in Taiwan 
uh, by civil society actors and uh, media stakeholders to foster media development uh, and a healthy and democratic information space can be a, a really valuable resource and perhaps even a foundation of sorts for efforts throughout the region. Um, in preparing for this event, I was equally struck by uh, the notion that the resilience of Taiwan's progress in this area, uh, being as it is, as, as Damon mentioned, at the epicenter of struggles to preserve and expand democracy, that Taiwan's own efforts may depend on restoring momentum uh, to media freedom and media development uh, in the region, which has been uh, sharply stilted in recent years. So I'll very briefly introduce our panelists, and then I'll say a few more words about each of their bios as I turn to them for comments. Uh, we have uh, four panelists today, uh, Johanna Gao, uh, the Regional Director for Asia for the International Republican Institute. We have Sarah Cook, the Research Director for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House. We have Chi Hao Yu, uh, co-director of the Information Operations Research Group. And uh, we have Sean C. Sheng Du, the Director of Policy Advocacy at the Taiwan Tongzi Hotline Association. Uh, after our panel discussion today, we're very pleased to have some closing remarks as well from Dr. Ketty Chen, who is the Vice President of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. Uh, I would like to begin uh, today with uh, Johanna. Uh, Johanna has served uh, for many years as regional director, but brings more than 20 years of experience in international political development, nonprofit management, and citizen empowerment to that role. Uh, she has lived and worked in the Asia region most of her life. Uh, and uh, it's uh, good to remember that the Asia division at IRR includes a diverse range of countries and political systems. Uh, where where Johanna has worked, ranging from Pakistan to the Philippines, Mongolia to, and Indonesia. Uh, so, Johanna, reflecting on this vast 20 years of experience that you have working to promote democracy and press freedom in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, we'd be grateful if you could open up the conversation by characterizing what you see as the opportunities and challenges to democratic progress in the region. And in your remarks, if you could say a few words about how you see Taiwan fitting into this regional context. Thanks very much. Over to you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for, for having me. It's it's a real pleasure to to be here on you know to have this discussion and to be with with all of these colleagues. So so thanks for for having me here. Um, you know, so when I think about sort of opportunities and challenges, I think one one big opportunity I see in Asia is just tremendous support for democracy as a system, right, and as a set of values. At IRI, we've done polling in countries across the region for, for many, many years. And this is something that we've been able to see fairly consistently over the last few years, which is this, the support for, for democracy as a system of governance. And the support for democratic values manifests in a couple of ways, right? It shows up in the development of strong civil society and non-governmental organizations, right? A belief that individuals have a role to play in both supporting and shaping their communities. And what we are seeing across the region is robust civil society developing in individual countries and also increasingly strong networks of civil society across between countries, across the region, where groups are sharing lessons learned and providing support to each other. The, the support for democ democratic values, I think, shows up also in the increased willingness of individuals to stand up and fight back against threats to their freedom, right? And that's been shown very dramatically in, in countries like Burma earlier this year, in Hong Kong and in Thailand in the recent past, um, you know, where you have thousands or hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets. Um, but we, you know, we also know it happens in thousands of small ways, you know, without getting any media courage every day across across the Asia Pacific. Um, and then the final sort of big opportunity that I'll mention, I'm I'm very I'm very optimistic about the role of youth, right? The Asia Pacific is home to just over a billion youth, sort of young people between the ages of 15 and 30-ish. Um, you know. Some of the big protest movements I, I just mentioned, Burma and Hong Kong, were largely, I mean, not completely, but largely led by young people, right? Young people taking action to protect freedoms and rights that they felt were under threat. And as this younger generation rises and begins to interact with political institutions, they're inevitably going to change them. 
Um, and I, I think that that sort of transformation, there's the potential to bring tension, but I think more hopefully, there's also a chance that it brings more openness to the political scene. When it comes to challenges, I think there's three big ones I want to mention here. I mean, first is, you know, what we see just this ongoing assault on fundamental rights, fundamental human rights and freedoms that's taking place across the region, right? In the extremes, we've got sort of the genocide against the Uyghurs by the Chinese Communist Party. That's been well documented. You know, we've seen the brutal crackdown on the protests in Burma, right, which is just an expansion of the, the brutality of the military hunter against people in Myanmar that's been taking place for years, especially against ethnic nationality groups. I mean, and then you add to that things like that, the, the ongoing threats to lives and livelihoods that have, have come up because of the COVID pandemic, right? And the fact that the long-term economic and societal impacts of the pandemic are very likely going to disproportionately affect youth. And things, things start to look pretty grim in the region as a whole. Um, the second big challenge, I think, when what tries what, what makes trying to protect fundamental rights more difficult now is that even as people express support for democracy as a system and for democratic values, what we're seeing is increasing skepticism, and particularly among young people, unfortunately, about the ability of democracy to deliver on its promises, right? It's, it's, a, it's like a declining faith in the ability of democratic institutions like political parties and government and the media to deliver on things like economic growth or addressing, um, you know, social and political challenges. And I think this trend has definitely been exacerbated by the pandemic, where we've seen governments using, you know, the need for things like public health controls as a pretext to introduce a range of restrictive laws, right? Laws that on one level could have a stated intention to fight mis or disinformation, but those same laws can easily be used to censor speech by anyone that's critical of the government in power. And I know we're going to talk a lot about press freedom, but you know, just to highlight how within the region, there's just huge pressure on independent media. Right? You have this great example of Maria Ressa, who's highly deserving of her Nobel Prize, but you know, we shouldn't forget that she and her news organization, Rappler, have been the target of politically motivated lawsuits and threats for years. Um, and, and it's just because they, like journalists across the region, are being attacked for doing their incredible, fundamentally important work of reporting on political leaders, governments, and institutions. Um, and then the third challenge that you know I, I want to mention is is really the role of the Chinese Communist Party of the CCP in actively undermining human rights and freedoms across the region. So starting in China, right, four fifths of the people who live under authoritarianism in the world live in China, and inside China, the CCP under Xi Jinping is seeking to enforce conformity, right, which has meant stamping out independent civil society voices or really just anything that diverges from the approved state line, right? If you expand that field of vision just a little bit, when you look at the introduction of the national security law in Hong Kong, right, this not only gave Beijing the, the ability to systematically dismantle the institutions that protected Hong Kong's freedoms, but because of its extraterritorial jurisdiction, it means it's now a crime for anyone anywhere in the world to do anything that the CCP considers an offense. And so if we're talking about challenges to democratic progress, that's a very big one. So just I'll close out, you know, talking about Taiwan and how it fits in the region. You know, if we look at democratic development as a continuum, right, where societies move along forward sometimes, sometimes backwards and then forwards again. You know, where I think Taiwan fits on that, sits on that continuum is in a place that is closer to more developed democracy, because democracy is not a destination. Right? Um, Taiwan, it's a place that embodies democratic values, right? It has worked hard to both create its democracy and to maintain it, despite the internal and external challenges. Um, having a thriving and evolving democracy in the region, and one that's trying to take on a lot of the challenges that I that I just mentioned and that we'll be talking about more today, um, I think that that's a really good thing for democratic development in the region. I think that Taiwan has a lot to offer, and there's also going to be a lot that it can learn as it forges stronger connections with other countries. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Johanna. Thank you. I'd like to... Uh...
pick up on one of the last threads there in relation to the activities of the of China and the CCP in the region. Uh, and I'll like to turn to Sarah Cook uh, to pick up on that. So Sarah Cook, as I said, is the research director for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House. Uh, she also directs, as I'm sure many of you uh, are aware, the China Media Bulletin, a monthly digest in English and Chinese, which provides news and analysis on uh, media freedom developments related to China. Uh, and Sarah is also the author of several Asian country reports for Freedom House. This is annual publications, as well as four special reports about China, and uh, is also the author of an oldie but goodie, The Long Shadow of Censorship, uh, a SEMA report published back, I think, in 2013. So it's great to have Sarah with us today. Uh, Sarah, uh, as, as Johanna pointed out, support for democratic freedoms uh, values remain strong in the region, uh, but many other indicators of democratic progress, especially in press freedom and civic space, are headed in the wrong direction. And uh, to a significant degree, uh, you know, this is attributable to uh, China's influence in the region. So could you say a few words, being an expert on this matter, on China's influence on information flows and on the uh, on the public sphere, uh, how that's affecting trends. Thanks. Sure, um, and this is a very good lead um, off after uh, Johanna's um, uh, uh, great comments. And th thanks again for, for including me. I, I think one useful way to think about it is the direct impact and the indirect impact. Because I think when we look at the different ways in which the CCP and China's and its activities and other actors within China that are under the influence of the CCP, some of the actions that they may take in the region that influence or manipulate information flows are very direct. They're directly tied back to actors in China and the CCP, and that's whether it's Chinese state media, whether it's some of the kinds of disinformation campaigns and information operations um, that groups like IORG have done such a great job of documenting and exposing, where it's really a direct effort to manipulate what's happening in within a particular uh, space. Um, I think, you know, then you've got this indirect element, which is that, like John was saying, you have opportunities and challenges in every country, and you have this whole cost-benefit analysis that different actors are making within different countries. You have the, you know, incentives that can push one way or another. And I think one of the biggest challenges with regards to China's role is not just that it's so authoritarian, it's that it's such a big economic player in the region. And you really can't separate that because that type of the economic leverage creates its own incentives, including in the media space, to not rock the boat, to be careful about how even, in, even taking it out, out the, you know, the more direct kinds of intimidation that you see as well, but just the fact that you have media outlets in places like, you know, like Malaysia who are afraid of rocking the boat. So they're not going to do as big of an investigative report on something because they don't want to mess up the bilateral economic relations. Um, and then you have this element of ways in which, you know, actors from China, including uh, China-based companies, um, you know, tip the balance in some of the countries that are leaning you know, and, a more, and leaders that are leaning in the more authoritarian dimension. And that's when you get into things like safe cities and surveillance equipments. So you have a situation where you have a country that's, you know, you know in the middle of the road often. I think it's especially, you know, there's a, the very much not free countries, and that's where you do see the influence. But it's really those partly free countries, I would say, in terms of how Freedom House rates, you know, looks at where different countries are. Where freedom is in the balance, there is the civil society actors and, and other democratic forces pushing in one direction, and then you've got those who are maybe inclined towards more authoritarian tendencies pushing in another direction, and that's where, including in the technological space, um, you know, as well as the economic cloud dimensions of it, uh, that the role of the CCP can really push things in in the wrong direction and really tip the balance. Um, and so I think when we look at what's happening, you know, in the region. Of course, this is not unique to the region. It's something that's happening globally. <laughs> um, and I think for some of our work, when we're looking at the way in which the Chinese Communist Party influences the media and information in other um, countries, we've kind of broken it down, the footprint, so to speak, into five, five ways. One is kind of the propaganda and the pushing of narratives. And even that, there's elements that are direct where it's clearly state media. But of course, the more insidious and trickier ones are the indirect. It's when it's working through some kind of local intermediaries, whether it's local media 
increasingly we're seeing social media influencers and others. And I think that goes to this point that Johanna was reading where youth are now becoming more of a target for CCP information influence manipulation, um, including in like a wide range of local languages. I mean, you know, like uh, young Chinese women who are speaking Sinhalese who are gaining followings in places like Sri Lanka, like really no market is too small. And there's a lot of effort to really produce content, you know, to their credit, I think, in, in local languages and try to influence perceptions and conversations. I think the next it are these more inauthentic type of campaigns related to, you know, manipulating global social media platforms. The third is, is the censorship side. It's where you get intimidation, physical intimidation, or the use of economic leverage, including behind the scenes through media owners with other kinds of business interests in China or ownership stakes, basically censoring their own journalists or encouraging self-censorship among their own journalists. And then you have this element, which is again, one of those things that's unique to China compared to other actors in the space, authoritarian actors, say like Russia, and that's the role of, of China-based companies controlling the content infrastructure in other countries. And that relates to digital television, which you see in Africa, but when I actually looked at my last report, like you actually see in Asia too, in Cambodia, in Laos, in, um, in Pakistan, uh, you know, China-based companies building digital television networks. And there is, you know, a, uh, a technological innovation dimension to it, to their, again, to their credit. But then piggybacked on that is that, you know, you suddenly have local audiences getting a lot more access to China state-run media, right? And maybe other alternatives, like in Africa, we see BBC, BBC World being much harder to access to, much more expensive to access. And then you have the app. So like one of the interesting things that is different in Asia is that WeChat, which is owned by Tencent, is not only used by the Chinese diaspora. Most places around the world, in the US and Australia, WeChat is primarily used by members of the Chinese diaspora. And that creates a lot of issues and problems in terms of what information they have access to and they can share. But in many countries in Asia, whether it's the Philippines, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, I think, Mongolia, even Myanmar, you have local, um, you know, not only Chinese speakers who are using that app. And I think there's been relatively little studying done on what's happening there, right? If there is any manipulation happening or, or, or how that affects the information that they, you know, that they have access to. Um, so, and then I think the last is this element of the propagation of non-democratic norms. So you see trainings of officials, you know, not just, you know, in terms of like, how do you manipulate public opinion, right? What are some tools you can use to monitor social media and affect how people think? Um, you know, spreading, you know, ideas about journal journalism, not so much as a watchdog kind of model of journalism, more let, you know, pro-government type of approach. So I think those are the things that we see generally, and we see that happening in the region. And you see, you know, the disinformation bans in the Philippines. You see, obviously, in Taiwan, of course, you see um, these trainings, lots of Indonesian officials going to China. So you definitely do see these things all happening in the region. I think the last thing I would say is kind of where does Taiwan fit into all of this? And I think to echo Johanna's point, I think what's really remarkable in Taiwan is that on the one hand, they're at the forefront. They're like, they're the test, it's the testing ground. It really is. Because back when I did the report in 2013 on the long shadow of Chinese censorship, that was, you know, a chapter on Taiwan that was looking at, you know, media purchases and changing. And, and when a media owner who has interest in China, you know, not only some of the blue owners, but also some of the ones on the green side of the political spectrum who are trying to sell, who are trying to sell dramas in China and, you know, then therefore having an influence because the economic balance is such that even a really popular program that great, gets great local advertising revenue can't compete with selling dramas in China in the market the size of China. So I think that, um, but I think the, you know, the, the flip side of being on the forefront is that you really do see whether it's the civil society groups or the government or collaboration with technology firms too, really innovative efforts and solutions to document and expose what's going on and to counter it in really creative ways that get directly to users in terms of media literacy, um, in terms of just nipping things in the butt, in terms of exposing the tactics. And I think that's one of the things that's really actually had an impact. I think that's where, you know, the Taiwan model, I think it shows people that there's hope, that it's not, you know, a small country like Taiwan with like some really innovative people and, and a real, you know, um, resilience uh, you know, can push back against a, a major election interference campaign from China. That's really impressive. And I think it does, 
does give people hope that this isn't this isn't hopeless because I think that idea that well there's nothing you can do about it, you just have to expect ex accept the CCP's dominance and its ability to influence and silence critical voices and do what it wants um, and give in to the bullying uh, is actually something the CCP really tries to play out. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Sarah. I mean, that's actually a perfect segue to our next speakers. Um, and uh, I could not agree more that, you know, in preparing for this event, hearing about what's happening in Taiwan, uh, you do realize that we have the, the feeling of hopelessness, uh, the feeling of being dispirited in the face of uh, real declines in press freedom, um, perhaps is unfounded, you know, and we see, we're gonna turn now to, to Chi Hao Yu, who um, really is emblematic of what can be accomplished with, uh, among young, driven, passionate people. So uh, Chi Hao, as I said, is the co-director of the Information Operations Research Group. And in a, a moment, I'm gonna ask uh, him to talk about uh, the research that that organization is doing, how it is uh, using a really innovative methodology, discovering what's uh, happening in those first two areas uh, that you mentioned of Chinese influence, the propaganda uh, and the inauthentic campaigns, uh, exposing those and also leading the way for uh, openness and transparency and media literacy as a, a counterbalancing effort against those kinds of malign influences. Um, Chi Hao is a contributor to GovZero, uh, a member of Archipelago Taiwan, uh, and he's one of uh, a few directors of the Taiwan Pangpa Association of Education. Uh, so Chi Hao is really at the, at the center of what is a remarkable and vibrant community of open source digital activist uh you know progressive minded uh and digitally savvy young people in taiwan who are really doing great things so um chi hao if if we could um uh, we'd love to hear from you a little bit about uh your research uh you know you're speaking to a layman audience so uh you know please try to explain the the methodology in terms that we can all understand but also the the findings uh that uh that you have come to with regard uh, to how um, China, through propaganda, through inauthentic campaigns uh, in last year's election and, and other ways, is is trying to infiltrate the kind of information and system and the narratives in the uh, media space in Taiwan. Ji Hao? Thank you, Nick, um, for the very um, kind introductions. Um, I would like to first start with um, uh, we at LRG um, couldn't do what we do without the support of our partners and our friends, both uh, domestically and internationally. So um, um, thank you a lot for, for your, all, your support and uh, continued interest. Um, and then second, listening to what Sarah was talking about, the uh, five sort of sides of Chinese influence, I'm definitely seeing all of that manifesting in, you know, more or less, some are supported by our own research, some are supported by I'm guessing uh, our day-to-day -day lives sort of experiences, uh, all of those uh, manifesting here in Taiwan society right now. Um, um, and we're fortunate enough to have some resources and have some brilliant people working with uh, myself um, to try, as Sarah brilliantly um, put, to document and to expose these um, problematic phenomenon um, that we call information manipulation. Um, we are IORG uh, is a, uh, civilian research organization. We're based in Taipei and we're founded in 2019 by some media workers, uh, data scientists, community activists, so on and so forth. Um, um, in sort of, in a response to sort of our worries of foreign influence and also sort of the long running problems of, um, uh, of our media environment, so to speak. Um, we sort of realized that uh, just um, there's a need of this kind of research. And over the, over the past two years, we realized that um, our research could, could influence and impact potentially government policies. And that would sort of, uh, that would impact our fundamental freedom of speech, right? That's uh, our most, probably the most treasured uh, 
one freedom. Um, so uh, we are our to take openness and transparency and accountability really, really seriously. So that's why we've chosen to do research that are both publicly verifiable, meaning that we use public information um, and, and the second uh, it's data driven. So we don't uh, pick our targets and then uh, interpret data that way. Um, we do it uh, in reverse, which is harder, but um, more scientific in our opinion. Um, our, our research method, so it's, it's all data driven. So that means, first of all, we have to build a really big database. Um, so our archive system is cross-platform, meaning that it encompasses a lot of the uh, tech platforms that we use day to day. For example, Facebook or Line or Taiwanese news platforms. Um, and uh, we also, thanks to the contribution of uh, GovZero, which is Taiwan's civic hacking community, uh, they provide, uh, some of the contributors have built uh, open data archives. So we use that as well. Um, and on top of that data archiving system, we build sort of a toolbox of, of data science. That means that we develop these processes that could identify trends and patterns and also anomalies from this huge database, right? Um, for example, we could summarize public discourse on a, on a certain topic. For example, COVID-19 vaccines. That's something that we as Taiwanese really care about for the last couple of months. Um, we could also identify suspicious narratives, right? From a large uh, data set, how do we group these sort of posts and articles and identify narratives from it? And we could also, because we have cross-platform data, we could also map the spread of narratives. Um, and then we could identify similarities and also differences between platforms, how one narrative might spread in this platform and how it might spread in the other. So I guess that's sort of the very brief and like non-technical as, as I'm, an, I'm of an engineering background, so I'm, hope, I'm hoping that that's useful and understandable. Please just interrupt me if, if, if I'm not making sense. So some findings, um, uh, let's just focus on this year, right? Uh, uh, and let's focus from April to October, which is sort of right before we had a spike of local outbreaks of COVID-19 here. Um, we've identified, in the period of time, we've identified 68 suspicious narratives. Uh, most of them are information manipulation, meaning that they contain sort of errors or logic, uh, or they contain like factual errors or logical errors. And among those 68, we identify with, with evidence, right? You can actually provide, we actually provide a link that you can click to and see sort of CCP post. Um, 37 of those narratives are, uh, we found that we found with uh, CCP participation. And the topics ranging from, you know, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, the pork importation here, um, the US Taiwan arms sales, and also recently Taiwan joining the CPTPP. Um, you know, some US uh, maybe, um, and then other topic includes like uh, when the US withdraw its forces from Afghanistan, we found that uh, CCP outlets are helping to spread US skepticism, uh, meaning that the content includes, you know, the US will abandon Taiwan or the US doesn't have enough power to protect Taiwan against uh, China or that the US is sort of the source of chaos and war, wars in the world. Um, those are the three sort of themes of these US, US uh, skepticism. Um, we also found that um, Weibo and CCP content, content is reaching Taiwanese audiences through Facebook pages, right? We, because we're a data-driven research, research uh, initiative, we are able to sort of compare similarities between posts, right? How similar is this CCP, uh, for example, foreign minister uh, newsletter uh, to this Facebook post? How, how similar is this Weibo content post to this line message, for example? So through that, we, we are able to identify that uh, a lot of Facebook pages are either uh, copying from Weibo or CCP content without telling the Taiwanese audience that it's actually from China 
or that they're masquerading its source, meaning that they're saying it's from you know American media, but it's actually from Chinese media. And one very prominent example is CC's World News, which is Wenqian Sijie Zhoubao, which uh, which belongs to CC Chen, who is a very prominent and well-known media personality here in Taiwan. And her focus is, I mean, allegedly to be international news, right? And um, just in uh, um, sort of, I think August through October last year, we found at least 10 times that her Facebook page has masqueraded CCP content as uh, content from Forbes, which is an American magazine. Um, um, we, aside from you know China related findings, we also found some domestic phenomenons, right? For example, the thing that I just talked about, uh, about Afghan, uh, the US Afghan re withdrawal. Um, we found that not all of these narratives are have sources in China, um, at least according to our database. Um, some of these narratives saying that the US will abandon Taiwan are actually from Taiwan domestically, um, again, according to our database. Um, we, we can also identify that content farm, which, which is uh, such a problem, I, I, I mean, I guess back in 2015 or so, are still alive and well on Facebook, meaning that a lot of people are still sharing links of these content farm articles, right? For example, regarding US, uh, sorry, you, regarding COVID-19 uh, COVID vaccines, uh, especially uh, about the Pfizer vaccine, which we call BNT here in Taiwan, and also the Medigen vaccine, which is locally uh, developed and produced here in Taiwan. About these two vaccines, people are sharing, uh, I mean, generally people are sharing a lot of news articles and content on Facebook about all kinds of COVID vaccines, but specific, specifically for BNT and for Medigen, people are sharing content from articles more than some Taiwanese major media outlets which is something that you can only do or you can only observe through data-driven methodologies, right? You can't think of, you know, 10 researchers looking through like a million Facebook posts to, to, to get that kind of finding. So in our, in our opinion, Facebook should, should do something about that. So that's some of uh, a lot of the findings that we've had um, throughout the months that I wanna highlight for you. And I'm happy to talk about more other things uh, that we do, including media literacy education and our current work, which is focused on the referendums that is coming up next month here in Taiwan. Yeah, maybe I'll stop there. Sorry if I'm taking my, too much time. No, that's brilliant, Jiho, and uh, you are uh, you managed to explain that in a way that even I could understand. So that was that was fabulous, and I, and I think what is remarkable about it, you call it data driven, but what it sounds like to me is it's really very holistic. You are building an architecture that isn't just about trying to detect a single isolated case that might be happening and tracking that, but building the architecture of a system that will provide long term and broad based resilience. Uh, so, you know, I think that is, uh, it's, it's really remarkable and it, it is, um, uh, I think something that would be great to explore in conjunction with other, uh, organizations and, uh, networks and communities in the region who are, are, are trying to do the same. If I can uh, add one more thing. Back in? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying to make it as open as possible. So that means that we're open sourcing a lot of our tools and open our, a lot of our data sets. So we're in process of doing that. So that means that we're very much looking forward to more collaboration openly and, and with accountable with accountability. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, I've gotten the strong impression that that open source, uh, I mean, open source is not just a technical spec. It is a philosophy on how to work together. And I see that influencing uh, your work and all the work in Taiwan. So that's that's terrific. Great. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Um, back to the back to a, a slightly more focused look at mainstream media, um, and I'd like to turn to to Sean for that. Uh, Sean Si Cheng Du, the director of policy advocacy at the Taiwan Tongzi Hotline Association, uh, owing in in part to the efforts of uh, the Tongzi Hotline, which is the oldest LGBTQ plus rights organization in the country. Taiwan became the first country in Asia to legalize same sex marriage. 
And uh, this is also, of course, partly a testament not just to Tongzi's great efforts, but to what can be accomplished within a vibrant and open public sphere. Uh, as, uh, you know, given the opportunity for people's democratic norms to shine uh, when, when presented with an honest and open debate, uh, you know, it's clear that the, the Taiwanese have chosen more freedom uh, uh, in the form of same-sex marriage. And so it's a, it's a great case, I think, to look at, uh, to hear from Sean a little bit in terms of how your organization engages with, uh, with media um, and uh, also turning to Sean, you know, to hear a bit about what more, more can be done to preserve uh, the pluralism in the sector that has benefited Tongzi and the struggle for equal rights for LGBTQ plus community members. Sean? Hey, Nick, and hi, everyone. So thank you for having me. And just a little clarification. So I just got promoted to become the new secretary general in our organization. <laughs> yeah. OK, so yeah. <laughs> Okay. Congratulations, so, uh, Sean. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, just uh, to a uh, next question. So, first of all, I must say that so compared to authoritarian states, LGBTQ issues can be reported by the media in Taiwan, and we can also express our opinion via media. We can also criticize the media outlets when they produce some news with misinformation or prejudice. So this freedom of speech is really important for us to share LGBTQ issues to be discussed and understood by general public, and therefore for us to fight for LGBTQ rights in Taiwan. So uh, in Taiwan, so there are many traditional media outlets, TV news channels. Um, I must say that most of them are owned by large corporates. And therefore, when a particular topic does not generate any commercial profits, it is less likely to be reported or to be accepted by the uh, editorial departments. So in the past couple of years, while we fight for marriage equality, actually it's a really big uh, movement bigger than uh, like um, any LGBT issues before. So because this topic promoted heated social discussions as well as became a political agenda, and because traditional media outlets were in fierce competition with each other, relevant issues also got to be covered by many traditional media out outlets, allowing them to reach a broader audience, but there were not so many in-depth discussions. So the freedom media environment in Taiwan has allowed many independent media platforms to develop. And compared to traditional media, independent media enjoys more freedom and liberty to report in-depth sensitive social, uh, social issues and social movements related to LGBTQ rights, such as LGBTQ families, LGBTQ adoption, LGBTQ youth and education, as well as the rights of people with HIV AIDS. Um, so prior to the last referendum about same-sex marriage and gender equity education in 2018, actually there were a large amount of false, uh, false information about same-sex marriage, about LGBTQ education and about HIV AIDS were circulating. So we therefore had more opportunities to collaborate with independent media outlets to clarify rumors and report facts. So I think these are the ways that we engage with independent media for LGBTQ rights in Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, a quick follow-up question for you. You know, your educational efforts vis-a-vis -vis in partnership with the media have been so important to this. Um, do you have some thoughts on how the Taiwanese government can assist you in these educational outreach efforts to, to continue the work and strengthen it? Okay, thank you for your question. So, um, as I mentioned that, so in the past few years, a lot of false information and fake news about LGBTQ and HIV AIDS were spread uh, through social media, even and even the traditional media does not always report true facts. For example, uh, there were a, 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 a television uh, 
news television called Zhongtian, Zhongtian Television, which was shut down a while ago. And once used a video made by an anti LGBTQ group that inaccurately accused our organization of encouraging high school students to use drugs. The TV channel did not check for facts before using the video, and nor did they provide a balanced report. So, because they, uh, this report, they just want to, I mean, the anti group want to attack um, uh, our group to anti LGBT, to attack LGBT group, so to let a uh, more general public to uh, think that, okay, so we don't need to support this LGBTQ. Uh, groups or LGBTQ rights because they will affect our next generation. They will teach our children to use drugs or teach our children to do sex uh, surgery. So, yeah, so actually at that time, our Ministry of Education and our CDC just work with NGOs to clarify this kind of fake information. So I think the first thing that the government could and should continue to do is to clarify those fake, false information and fake news. And the second thing that the government can do is to include media literacy into our education. And yeah, because I know that after that referendum, many um, many group, many NGOs are trying to do this media literacy by themselves. But I we know that uh, if our government can put more efforts on this, uh, we can make it better. And another thing I would like to mention is that in Taiwan, so rich groups could influence traditional media more. So like in, in the marriage equality movement. So because the anti LGBT group, groups, because they are like a Christian church based, so they are really rich and they have a lot of money. And so they have the resources to purchase advertisements on traditional media, such as newspapers and TV channels. And they can spread this false information and try to influence general public. Because we know that uh, people, in especially all, uh, people beyond the uh, middle age, um, they still watch or read uh, like uh, traditional media. So what we think is that our government should do more social education to let the society get better understanding on LGBTQ and sexual minority. Because what we see is that this, uh, you know, our resource is really, uh, um, really different. We have less resources. We are less uh, able to let more people understand about LGBTQ and to listen to LGBTQ stories. So if our government can do more social education on this part, and what actually we all, our government already did like produce some uh, video um, about uh, LGBTQ uh, stories in the past few years, which we think is good. But most of these videos are shown on uh, no, on um, online, so not on traditional media. So if uh, they can put more effort on this, I think we can have more people to get better understanding on um, um, LGBTQ people. Thank you. Thanks, John. That's terrific. Uh, and it, it also provides, uh, you've raised another issue that really links strongly to Chi Hao's work. So uh, with regard to media literacy, you know, and I think what's remarkable about your story is that, you know, Tongzi hasn't just benefited from a plural media environment. You've helped to build a more plural media environment. You've helped to uh, build an information ecosystem that encourages verification, trustworthiness, uh, and pluralism in the system. You know, and in, in that respect, uh, you know, we talk about media independence, but I, I wonder frequently whether it's a slight misnomer. I think what we often maybe should be talking about is interdependence, you know, which is a state in which democratic actors, civil society, progressive minded, uh, you know, government reformers, you know, are really vested in uh, preserving the media sphere, traditional and digital uh, as, um, you know, as a, a sphere of public debate of open, uh, transparent and trustworthy public debate. Uh, so, you know, you've, it sounds like you've really contributed to that uh, as well as benefited from it. Um, and in that regard, I'd like to turn to Chi, to Chi Hao. Uh, you also, in your work, your research, 
has begun to inform efforts, pretty significant efforts, uh, for a media literacy campaign uh, integrated into the curriculums, potentially, of schools across Taiwan. So could you say a few words about that, where that work is going, Jihao? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I think I'd like to point out that we are only a small part of the whole society approach here in Taiwan against uh, well, to strengthen public information literacy uh, as opposed to against anything we need to make ourselves healthier and stronger, right? Um, and we think that's the ultimate and sort of mo the most sustainable solution uh, um, to have a more healthy public debate, public discourse in the media environment and all that. And I totally agree that uh, the LGBT group here have contributed to that um, in sort of pushing the boundaries and uh, making people more informed about people who are possibly different from themselves. Um, um, in, the, in the past month or in the past years, we've seen a lot of community driven initiatives here in Taiwan about fact checking, about social dialogues. We've seen more investigative reporting done by the media, fact-checking initiatives done by media organizations. We've seen more research, um, academic research, some of them, um, IRG is uh, merely a part of that. We've seen government reforms, of course, on education as, uh, in particular. We've seen more international engagements such as this event. Um, all of those are helping Taiwan um, to be stronger and then sharing our experiences with our international friends. Um, in, 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 um, in sort of our own work to strengthen public media literacy, um, sort of as the phase one of IRG, we've hosted 68 workshops across Taiwan. Um, we visited every municipalities and counties aside from Jilong, which we apologize sincerely. Um, because we want to learn the different, <laughs> because we want to learn the different uh, sort of faces of disinformation or fake news uh, in Taiwan, right? Um, among different age groups in different localities for different professions, uh, because it's 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 already a part of our life and it's not going anywhere. And it's essential for us to sort of walk out of our offices and to learn from local communities and um, and not only about sort of the content and the spread, but also about what they need. Um, yeah, so uh, at the end of all that, um, uh, we found that a lot of people are already know, uh, what they already know about sort of fake news or false information, right? But not enough people are proactively doing something about it. For example, verifying it online or reporting it to fact-checking organizations, or you know, asking the government agencies if things are false or truth. Um, so we we'd like to think that our workshops have helped with that, making people more proactive. Um, in terms of schools, we've worked with um, Taiwan Bangpua Association of Education, which is. Um, association that I co-founded um, with some of the friends who are thinking about uh, bringing civil society issues into schools, right? Into particularly into middle and high school, which uh, which we think are vital sort of periods of time in in our growth. So this is sort of a recent uh, realization: is that as a Taiwanese person, in when I was in school, I was never given a proper media literacy education. And I would like, I would, I mean, I think that most of us here growing up is in the same situation. So how can we expect uh, people in my generation to be, you know, independent thinker, to be a responsible <laughs> member of our democracy, right? Without that kind of uh, training and education and experience, this is this is something, this is something that takes practicing, right? Like voting, like uh, you know, deciding things for yourself. Um, so we'd like to think that uh, going to schools is, is one of the most important things. And our approach is to help the teachers and then they would help the students. Um, because although we've had in Taiwan the 108 curriculum, which includes media literacy as one of the core competencies, 
um, it's I would say lacking. Uh, there, there's lacking sort of government support or institutional support for in individual teachers who are you know already in a classroom and you know ready to teach but don't know because they're probably you know in the same age as I am or uh, older, um, and they're in the same situation as I I am. You know. Um, so we've worked with uh, you know more than a thousand teachers in the past uh, couple of months, um, and sort of created this model that we call researcher educator collaboration. Um, it, it, because media literacy or information literacy, as we'd like to call it, is such a complicated topic, right? You know, you're dealing with traditional media, uh, print media, but you're also dealing with emerging technologies that even our you know me we don't know how to use like the new apps, right? <laughs> how do you deal with uh, TikTok and Xiaohongshu and all sorts of, you know, audio visual stimuli of, of the modern society. So uh, we, we hosted, we host training and cold preparation workshops with the students and in small groups, right? Uh, in Taiwanese, in Taiwanese terms, yan xi and gong bei which means that you have to spend long hours with the teachers. You first, might, you might want to prepare your material for them and then you work with them to fit, to brainstorm and develop class material that can actually use in class, right? Uh, it would be a teaching plan of, you know, five classes or 10 classes or even longer. And this sort of feeds back to why we think data-driven research is so important is because the people are innately sort of here in Taiwan against sort of politics entering the school. So if your research is not science scientific, it's only rhetoric, how do you say, rhetorical or whatever, it's only your opinion, then uh, these educators who are seriously considering, you know, their multiple limitations would not be able to take your research and transform that into class material. Um, so, and, yeah, and then also to add a point, one other <laughs> reason, sorry, this is all messing up in my head. One other reason is that we've confronted with people who, who you know, probably has different political opinions with us who might support, you know, who's my, who might be more pro-China and questioning us, yeah, you know, are we, <laughs> are we working for the DVP or are we funded by this and that? And we always say that, you know, we're not supporting anyone with our research. Our research is you know, open and verifiable. You can just go to our website and click on the link and say, actually, yes, CCP has said this in this time that helps spread this kind of narrative, right? We're not trying to defame anyone. We're not trying to express our, overly express our opinions. Of course, we have opinions. Um, yeah, sorry, that might, that was too long. <laughs> Maybe I'll no, but it. it was it was it was it was terrific, Chihao. It was great to hear all about this, these efforts and this researcher teacher collaboration in which you are co-creating the curriculum. You know, it sounds like just a really interesting example to learn from. Um, and on that, you know, I, with the 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 last bit of time that we have here, I'd like to zoom back out to the regional level. So, you know, we've heard a lot about the really interesting efforts in Taiwan. And I think the conversation has made clear that, I mean, there's a lot of great, hopeful and innovative work going in, going on in Taiwan. Um, and that you, you may not have all the answers. There are still challenges, uh, but there's a real commitment to finding uh, a democratic response to these challenges through openness, through multi-stakeholder dialogue, through collaboration. And, you know, it's uh, whether it's Tongzi or, or IORG, um, it, you're, you're building these broad multi-stakeholder coalitions founded on democratic norms to try to find the solutions. And, uh, you know, I think that's partly what's so inspiring about looking at the Taiwanese example. Um, but I'd like to turn to, to Sarah and ask her opinion on, uh, on the lessons that can be drawn. I mean, I know you are familiar with IORG and a whole host of organizations working on uh you know chinese propaganda and disinformation campaigns in taiwan and in the region can you sarah share with us your reflections a little bit on what can be drawn from the broad efforts of these civil society coalitions uh, in taiwan what lessons can be drawn and how they might fit into a, a stronger regional effort 
uh, in favor of an open democratic media system and public sphere? Sure. I think there's just so much to learn in terms of how replicable a lot of what you've spoken about is. Um, and I think in terms of what you have, whether you're talking even about, you know, the data driven analysis, especially where if, you know, to the extent, you know, if linguistically it's possible to isolate a particular information ecosystem online because, you know, it's in Bahasa or if it's in Malay or something like that, right? That there's just so much potential there, as you said, to identify both the potential, you know, manipulations coming from a China-based actors, but also domestic actors. Because if you actually look, obviously it's a global issue. If you read through like Google's takedown reports, which I did recently for a piece I was writing, you know, you have local actors in all kinds of different countries having YouTube channels be taken down. That being said, I did some math and the China linked ones were by far the most. It was like 10,000 YouTube channels since January. The Russians, it was like a couple hundred. So it wasn't like even, even close. So I think in terms of, you know, the scale, and I think there is, you know, in other countries, probably more of this happening than we're aware. And I think especially also thinking about these particular moments in time that can be particularly vulnerable, especially say surrounding elections. So like the Philippines is one example where there have been some Facebook takedowns indicating that, you know, there's this, you know, that's also a country where you've got a more liberal president who is pro-China in certain ways and has actually learned a lot and actually got really some really, in the like the presidential media offices, I understand there's like some real collaboration and training and work that's been done with China-based that with CCP actors. And so you do also see some, at least one, there was already one Facebook campaign that seemed to be more related to domestic candidates, you know, for a presidential election. And so their elections are going to be in May. So to the extent that, you know, some of what, you know, folks in Taiwan were able to do surrounding the 2020 election, you know, can be shared with, can be replicated with local civil society. You guys have figured out some of the hardest parts. And obviously there's always resource constraints and even expertise constraints. But I think thinking about how to replicate this and work with civil society is, is really interesting. And then again, I mean, I think this like, you know, the, the teacher, you know, the teacher researcher, but when you're talking about media literacy, um, you know, is, a, is another element. I mean, I think what's so impressive in Taiwan is this multi-stakeholder approach where you've got actors from the government and the tech sector and so you've got, you know, these bots that are designed to automatically fact check online and then anybody can, you know, enter it in. I think, and that, that really, you know, it is, the CCP takes a whole of society approach to manipulation. So you really do need a whole of society response in terms of resilience. So, um, but I, I would say that I think, you know, when you look at specific examples and we're in the process of doing a big research project that has a lot more in-depth country case studies on these issues, both on the footprint and resilience. That won't be out for almost another year, so I'll have more examples then. But I, it does include a good, I mean, Taiwan is one of the countries, but I think one of the things that, you know, as we're waiting for the research findings to come back, I'm really interested to see what some of the local civil society groups are doing. Because I think in a lot of these countries, you do have groups working on disinformation issues or content manipulation. They're just, or media freedom, certainly. They're just not always attuned to the China part of the puzzle. Um, and so I think that's one of the questions is, how do you do, how do you work with that? How do you help people see? In some cases, maybe there's nothing to see, but I think what we're seeing more and more is often there is something happening in a lot of these places. Um, but so I think you, but you do see examples of journalists in Sri Lanka or Thailand, like writing a big report about actually, you know, this information you're seeing in your local media is actual, you know, tracing that back, even in traditional media to what the actual origin of the content is. And I think you do also see civil society groups in Taiwan really engaging regionally and internationally on these questions. So actually this week, um, um, Double Think Labs is hosting the China, is working to host the China in the World Conference. So I'll be on a panel about that, you know, later this week. But it is really, I think there is a, you know, there are some real efforts at that kind of international and regional outreach. But what strikes me is just the, re the replicability potential some of the things that you know was talking about. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Johanna, I'd like to turn back to you. Um, you know, because in the preparation for our event, you had some interesting things to say also about the power of example. Um, and you know, now having heard from IORG and Tongzi about the genuine efforts in Taiwan uh, 
to promote a free and vibrant media space and the honest challenges they face. Um, could you say a few words about how this, the openness and the honesty of the conversation in Taiwan is itself uh, something to build upon in the region? And, uh, and then just generally how you see at IRI um, the potential role of Taiwanese civil society uh, regionally and strengthening norms of pluralism and, and media independence. Yeah, thank you. It's been such an interesting conversation. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, I've, I've worked for the last 20 plus years on strengthening democracy in the Asia Pacific region. And, and it's a lot of the challenges, a lot of the challenges we've, that have come up in this discussion today and a lot of the challenges that, that we've seen, these are things that are unique to every country, right? And at the same time, I've, I've seen there are so many commonalities between countries across the region about how some of these challenges come about and really importantly, how solutions can be developed. And, you know, I think part of what makes democratic development work, you know, so challenging is how deeply personal it is, right? It requires these really fundamental conversations within societies and countries like what do we want our country to be about right you know how how should we be embodying democratic values and how how comfortable are we shining a light on our flaws and mistakes in order to learn from them and just do better um and so this is where taiwan as a democracy with a very strong commitment to fundamental freedoms i think the experience of taiwan has really valuable lessons for countries in asia and around the world right most fundamentally What's come out of this discussion is how Taiwan is a showcase of how to utilize democratic values to address challenges that emerge, right? Whether it's the multi-stakeholder approach that we were just talking about, or you know, earlier the commitment to open source as a philosophy, this all really matters, right? Taiwanese can talk about the fact that they have a recent history of martial law that they've overcome, right? That they've had large people people power movements that have influenced the political scene, right? These, all of these experience, you know, lead to an environment where clearly citizens feel empowered to work to solve governance challenges, right? And so they volunteer, they create a robust civil society and, you know, engage in other grassroots efforts to try to address social problems and also to work to really constructively influence policymaking. You know, Chihau and Sean have both talked about these incredibly exciting initiatives that are community-driven efforts, right? And I really loved, you know, something Chihau said about how they're trying to help people be more proactive. And I think these are examples that can provide both inspiration, but also the technical steps, right? The technical know-how for a whole range of efforts. So whether, you know, you're looking at the interaction between technology and democracy, or looking at how to advance LGBTQ plus rights, countering authoritarian influence, you know, both domestic and, and foreign, um, how to build trust in democratic institutions or how to support young people to participate in, in politics, right? These are all issues that we at IRI, we've started to incorporate Taiwanese experts into our research and also into our projects around the region to, 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 to further share those, those experience and that expertise. And I just, you know, to sort of put a bit of nuance on this, you know, I think the other reason why Taiwan is so important in the Asia Pacific is as a, a regional example. And, and what I mean by that is international organizations like, like IRI, right, and the NED, you know, we can contribute to and we can support the stakeholders who are working on, you know, tackling these challenges that we've been talking about. We can offer up technical assistance and moral support, but what we have learned is that what most of what is most compelling for our partners is to hear from their peers, right? From people who have literally walked the same kind of paths that they are walking and can offer advice and support that comes from, that can only come from really hard earned experience. And so the fact that Taiwan is in the neighborhoods and has been affected by some of the same socioeconomic and political dynamics that affect other countries in the region as well, I think that makes that made six example even more even more compelling. Thanks, Johanna, and I, I couldn't agree more. There's just no substitute for the power of of peer learning. There's nothing more effective than um, hearing from uh, you know uh, hearing from a peer. 
Um, this has been terrific. I, I have a couple of final reflections before uh, turning it over to Dr. Chen. Um, so this has been fascinating for me. And, um, you know, recently I, I, I just rejoined SEMA. Before rejoining SEMA, one of the last things I did was uh, helped produce the upcoming World Trends Report on Freedom of Expression and Media Development, the UNESCO kind of flagship report, which is being launched uh, tomorrow. And there was a bit of data that didn't, didn't end up in that report, a bit of an analysis that uh, is actually relevant for this conversation today. So uh, when we were looking at the data, you know, you'll see that with regard to media freedom, as measured by the varieties of democracy data set, CPJ's data set, sadly no longer measured by Freedom House, but that's another story. Um, you know, the the Asia region, of course, is uh, is not doing well. It's been on the decline since 2010. And uh, it is the, the Middle East and North Africa is the only region that's performing more poorly than the Asia, than the Asia region. Um, and, uh, and of course, the decline, you know, there have been declines in, uh, in countries like the Philippines that for a long time uh, were bastions of democracy in the region. Uh, there's a mismatch, however, between uh, what the expert panels say is happening with media, media freedom and what the public thinks. So uh, Johanna has pointed out that public surveys show uh, broadly a great deal of support for democratic norms. However, a Gallup survey, the global Gallup survey that looks at perceptions of media freedom uh, found in the Asia region that 65% of respondents felt that yes, uh, the media system has a great deal of freedom. And so I, I think it does suggest that more work needs to be done in terms of awareness. And, you know, we talk about media literacy, but actually, I think there's something else that's happening in Taiwan, which is about media policy literacy or about media sector literacy. You know, it's it's not just uh, teaching people when they go online, you know, to distinguish between, well, this is a good journalism, journalistic outfit, and this is not a good one. Um, it's about making them feel engaged in the preservation of a media system that is itself trustworthy uh, and has integrity. And I, I think what I hear from both of our panelists from Taiwan today is or, that they've built this really broad based multi stakeholder effort that builds that kind of literacy, not just on the content, but on the system itself. And that is, uh, I think, sometimes neglected in our conversations. But there is also something that I think is um, in Taiwan, it's special and a little hard to replicate which is the solidarity that allows for those multi-stakeholder networks to, to develop. And we see, uh, at least elsewhere in the world, sometimes the field of media, uh, of journalism falling apart, divisions between the new digital upstarts and the old uh, analog media outlets. Uh, I've seen in my work, you know, real divisions sometimes between the open source community of, you know, young and uh, smart and savvy and internationally minded uh, you know, digital folks with journalists, and they sort of, you know, look down upon those uh, those journalists as corrupt, and uh, and the journalists look at the digital uh, folks as out of touch with national politics. You know, so it seems like in Taiwan you have an environment in which you've been able to bring all these folks together, and actually, you know, civil society, the digital side, the media side, and and I think that's frequently lacking. But not to say that we can't work to start to bring those folks together. And actually, I think the Taiwan story is an illustration of how important it is to build that solidarity. Um, so, you know, those are a couple of the takeaways uh, that, that I've gotten from this really excellent conversation. Um, I, I was gonna say, SEMA has done a, a series of regional consultations to look at what is, ha what is needed regionally um, for media development as well. Um, and uh, we did one, among nine Southeast Asian nations back in 2016. Uh, and I'll just share the three findings from that as well to, uh, to further add to this conversation. So the conclusions from that conversation were that, uh, you know, at least Southeast Asia, though I think this is true more, more broadly in uh, the Indo-Pacific, um, you know, lacks special regional mechanisms uh, for bolstering the protection and the development of the media sector. Now, of course, you know, relying on the official 
multilateral bodies would not be a viable solution in Southeast Asia or elsewhere. This would have to be a civil society based regional mechanism. Uh, but uh, it is one area that has been lacking uh, in that region and that has been a benefit uh, in, you know, in Latin America and Africa, for instance. Uh, the other area where I think there's a, a need regionally is you know, a, a greater solidarity uh, and a process for engaging the global internet intermediaries. You know, it sounds like you know, in, in Taiwan, you're doing your fair share to point to Facebook when, uh, when for example, on DC Chen's Facebook page, essentially being a, you know, a, a, a reproduction of, uh, of, of CCP content. Um, but, you know, those small efforts to influence Facebook are, are, and other platforms uh, face real challenges. So, you know, building uh, the kind of organizations that can collectively engage with these platforms was uh, put forward as, as, as important. And finally, uh, you know, promoting and expanding media and information literacy at a sufficient scale to have an impact at the societal level. It sounds like you're really doing that in Taiwan. Um, and we heard from other folks in the region an interest in building those kinds of, you know, really large scale uh, media literacy campaigns. So, uh, you know, I think it, this really suggests that there's something to build upon in Taiwan uh, to work in that direction. Uh, so, look, it's been a real pleasure for me to moderate, and uh, I've learned so much from you guys. Thanks so much for the invitation uh, and to the, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy for the invitation for me to, to moderate. Um, I would like to then turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Chen. Uh, Ketty Chen is the vice president, uh, and Ketty, I hope you haven't been uh, promoted to president. Have you in the last uh, 24 hours? Just double checking. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, Terrific. Good. I'm glad we're clear on that. All right. So she's the vice president of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, responsible for overseeing international affairs and uh, the general administration of the TFD. Uh, Dr. Chen's writing has appeared in uh, the Nikkei Asian Review, China File, and the Prospect Journal. Uh, she has been referenced in publications and in international media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Associated Press, Al Jazeera, New York Times, many others. Uh, and she's contributed, her, her chapters have appeared uh, in the book, Taiwan's Social Media under Ma Ying Zhao and Cities Unsilenced. Uh, her most recent work was published in uh, Taiwan, Taiwan in Dynamic Transition, Nation Building and Democratization. And that came out last year. And I think I'll, I'll be looking for that shortly. Uh, so Dr. Chen, uh, I give you the floor for some closing remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, first, I really want to thank you and also the National Endowment for Democracy for partnering with the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy um, to host the site event um, during the U.S.-Taiwan consultation on um, democratic governance in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, even though the consultation uh, had the inaugural session um, in 2019, and we've done it twice, and this is actually the first time that we organized a side event um, featuring uh, independent um, media and also uh, Taiwan's uh, civil society and their role. So I am really looking forward to having future um, engagement with uh, you, Nick, and Sima, um, with Joanna, uh, Sarah, and of course, um, our Taiwanese partners um, to further uh, our discussion on uh, Taiwan's role in uh, independent media, um, combating uh, information manipulation, um, and uh, many other uh, issues. Um, because uh, we cannot have um, the site events for uh, a very long time, um, we could only invite um, our Taiwanese partners, um, Zhihao and uh, uh, Sean, uh, to come uh, share their experience with us. But um, I am um, very confident that there's other uh, members of civil societies in Taiwan who are more than willing to share their experience on women uh, empowerment, on youth engagement in social issues and politics um, that I think uh, in the future we're going to have many uh, productive and fruitful events. Um, but I also really want to thank um, our partnership with Freedom House and IRI. Um, IRI has uh, its office in Taipei um, this year. So I'm very much looking forward to um, our collaboration in many of these issues that we uh, that we uh, mentioned today. 
Um, so um, I really think that the Taiwan experience um, can serve as an example um, for countries in the region. But at the same time, I think it's um, um, very fortunate that Taiwan has uh, went through its political history and, and events as it was um, so that um, there's a vibrant civil society that um, that was created during the uh, authoritarian era and through Taiwan's democratization um, and liberalization. Um, so, you know, the Taiwan model, the Taiwan experience, um, I thought that it's important for democracy advocacy in the region. And I know that Taiwanese organizations and Taiwanese people are more than willing to share their experience with those who are willing um, to listen and um, also share their, their experience with us. So um, I, I want to take this opportunity again to thank everyone for uh, taking their time. And thank you, Nick, so much for being such a great moderator. Um, it's really good to see you, uh, Joanna and uh, Sarah. Um, so thank you everybody for your time. And uh, we hope uh, to see you um, in Taiwan uh, uh, in, the, in the very near future. So thank you so much.